Welcome to NBAC. Today, we're going to talk about a method we use to recover very small items from archaeological sites. Along with artifacts, field notes, photos, and maps, we often bring back soil samples, like these. Sometimes we bring back hundreds of liters of soil that can weigh hundreds of pounds. Why do we collect these bags of dirt? They're for flotation, our topic for today. In the field, when we're excavating, we screen soil through quarter-inch mesh that catches fairly small items. But things smaller than a quarter inch are hard to see in the field and go right through the screen. These things include artifacts, animal bones, and plant remains. Collecting soil samples and processing them through flotation helps us recover these tiny remains. And analyzing them tells us quite a bit about past environment and people's lives. With flotation, a soil sample is first dried and then immersed in water. The light organic material, mostly charred plant remains, floats to the top and is poured off and collected. This light floating material is called the light fraction. Whatever sinks to the bottom, the heavy fraction, can include leftover sand and rock, as well as pottery and stone artifacts, bone, and shell. Light or heavy, these small remains can provide important information on the site. Let's look at this process in more detail, starting in the field. Soil, or matrix, samples are usually taken from features. Features are areas such as storage pits, refuse pits, and hearths that often have concentrations of artifacts, bones, or charcoal. A feature might contain layers or zones that reflect a series of different activities. We take samples from features or zones within them to help us understand the different activities represented. We often take samples from locations that look especially interesting, such as a zone with lots of charcoal or animal bone. The samples are collected in plastic bags and labeled with their provenience, the exact location they came from as well as the date and the initials of who took the sample. The samples are brought into the lab and the bags are opened to let the soil dry. The soil must be completely dry or the light fraction won't float properly. Spreading out a soil sample on a tray can help it dry more thoroughly. Once the sample is dry, we need to record some information about it before we do anything else. The provenience information that was written on the bag in the field must stay with the light and heavy fractions as they're processed. That's the only way to know where each sample came from and how the artifacts and remains in it relate to the rest of the site. So before we float each sample, we make a tag for the light fraction and another tag for the heavy fraction. Both tags have the provenience and another crucial piece of information, the volume of the sample. If you know the volume of a sample, you can figure out the density of plant and animal remains and artifacts within it. For instance, we might find out that one sample contains dozens of tiny flakes in each liter of soil, while another is only a few. When we're using the bucket method you'll see here, we usually float about four liters at a time. Some samples are larger than that, so we need to float them in four liter batches. Larger samples give us a more accurate representation of what's in the feature of a zone. The buckets we use have lines inside for measuring the volume. This one has already been rinsed to make sure there's no soil left from the previous sample. So we can just pour the next sample into it and record the volume. We want to make sure to get all of the soil out of the bag. Our flotation log helps us keep track of the samples and when they were processed. For each sample, it has the provenience information, soil volume, flotation date, 
and the person's name who floated it. We'll need some other things in place before we start floating our sample. The light and heavy fraction will be poured into fine mesh screens and transferred to unbleached muslin to dry. We get the muslin ready by using clothespins to fasten it to a colander. After we immerse the soil, we'll pour off the light fraction into a geologic screen with a number 40 mesh which has 40 openings per inch in both directions, much finer than a normal window screen. This captures incredibly small material, including tiny seeds. Rinsing the screen before we start, make sure there's nothing left from a previous sample. Finally, we're ready to turn on the faucet and use the hose to fill the bucket with water. The optimal water flow is strong enough to gently agitate the soil and release the light fraction, but not forceful enough to churn up the heavy fraction and cause it to stream out too. In the first few minutes, an explosion of light fraction material comes loose and floats to the surface which turns dark with these organic particles. Tipping the bucket at an angle allows the light fraction to flow down into the screen. Gently agitating the soil by moving around the hose releases more of the light fraction. This process of filling the bucket, pouring off what rises to the top, and gradually releasing more light fraction from the sample continues until the water runs clear. Once we pour the light fraction into the screen, we need to transfer it to the muslin for drying. Gently rinsing the light fraction helps remove any foam that could cause the fragments to stick together as they dry. Then, we carefully wash the light fraction into the muslin, making sure to reach every part of the screen. When that's done, we rinse out and brush the screen so it will be clean for the next sample. Next, we carefully bundle up the ends of the muslin and tie them together with the twist tie and tag we prepared earlier. Then, we set the sample on a rack to dry, usually for at least 24 hours. Now we fasten another piece of muslin to the colander and get a screen ready for the heavy fraction. If the heavy fraction contains coarse sand that would clog a 40 mesh screen, we can use a larger 20 mesh screen instead. That way the sand will wash through. The heavy fraction simply gets washed into the screen and gently rinsed. Overloading the screen can cause it to get clogged and overflow, so it's best to work slowly. As you can see, fine sediment goes through the screen and runs down the drain. We need to make sure all of the soil gets washed out of the bucket, especially any cotton or ridges. After the heavy fraction is fully rinsed with no more fine sediment flowing through the screen, it's time to carefully pour it into the muslin. We make sure rocks and sand don't pull the edges of muslin loose or damage the more delicate materials. Then, we bundle up and tag the heavy fraction and set it on a rack to dry, just as we did the light fraction, and rinse the screen, colander, and bucket. After we finish the heavy fraction, we'll clean any sediment out of the sink so nothing makes its way into the next sample. 
and the area in general stays clean. Where does all this sediment go? We don't want to clog our drains or send it into the sewer system, so we have a sediment trap. The trap collects the sediment, and then we scoop it out by hand and take it to a designated spot outside for disposal. After the light and heavy fractions are completely dry, they can be sorted and examined for what they contain. First, we open the muslin and carefully pour it onto a paper lined tray. Next, we funnel it into a bag that's labeled with the provenience and cataloging information. Then comes the actual sorting process. In the light fraction, charred plant remains, such as seeds, are separated from wood and rootlets. In the heavy fraction, artifacts, bone, and shell are separated from sand and rock. Light fractions are sorted and examined under a microscope. Plant remains can be incredibly small or fragmentary, so a keen eye is important. We use a small paintbrush to separate different types of plant material. These can include charred remains such as blackberry, tobacco and goosefoot, corn kernels and cob fragments, nutshell and wood charcoal, and modern plant remains such as uncharred seeds and rootlets. Once they're analyzed, plant remains tell us about the local environment and how people who lived at the site used plants for food or other purposes. Around La Crosse, charred corn, beans, squash, and tobacco seed provide evidence that these crops were grown and eaten, or in the case of tobacco, smoked. Nutshell and seeds from fruits such as blackberry show that people were collecting wild resources from nearby wooded hillsides. Charred plant remains can also be used for radiocarbon dating that tells us when the site was occupied. Heavy fractions can usually be examined with the naked eye. In sorting through it, we look for stone flakes and tools, pieces of pottery, and any other artifacts, as well as animal bones and shell. These items provide insight into what people were doing at the site and what they were eating. Any artifacts and animal remains we find are cataloged. And like the plant remains, they're incorporated into the interpretation of the site. For instance, fish bones from sites near La Crosse tell us that people ate fish from the Mississippi River. Deer bone fragments document the hunting, processing, and eating of deer. And small flakes tell us about stone tool making. Some matrix samples are incredibly rich, producing lots of light fraction or abundant fish bone in the heavy fraction. But even scant remains are useful. They still tell us about the site and the intensity of occupation and let us know what we are not finding as well as what we are. Finally, we bag up the light and heavy fraction and also the things that we sorted from them. A label placed in every bag holds detailed information on the contents and where they came from. The samples are filed and stored so we can look at them again as needed or perform new analyses in the future. There you have it, the basics of flotation without even getting wet. And that is how, with the right process and really simple but effective equipment, a seemingly nondescript bag of dirt can reveal a wealth of information and become an integral part of archaeological research.